Hey everyone, it's been a minute, but stay tuned because today we're going to talk about these four 16 millimeter cameras. All right, before we get started, I want to apologize in advance if uh, you hear any footsteps uh, from my neighbor walking right upstairs, perils of apartment life. And uh, before we get into the cameras themselves, let's take a look at this 16 millimeter film. 16 millimeter motion picture film was developed by Kodak in 1923 as a less expensive alternative to traditional 35 millimeter film. 16 millimeter film was really the first amateur motion picture film and it was aimed at families making home movies. 16 millimeter home movie cameras were simple, compact, and easy to operate, making them ideal for amateurs. However, professional filmmakers found 16 millimeter attractive as well, uh, this less expensive formats like 8 millimeter and Super 8 eclipsed it in popularity for home movies, 16mm, originally decried as an inferior format, came to be seen more and more as a film stock for professionals. It was widely used by military cameramen in World War II and was basically the standard format for educational films and many documentaries. If you're of a certain age, you definitely remember the teacher wheeling in the 16mm projector during class, and every teacher of a certain age knows exactly how to thread and focus that projector. 16mm has also found a home in theatrical movies. Directors who shot on 16mm include Ryan Coogler, Catherine Bigelow, and Orson Welles. Many modern filmmakers choose to shoot on 16mm for the gritty analog look it gives, a look that digital can't match. Some well-known films shot on 16mm include Black Swan, The Hurt Locker, The Old Man and the Gun, and Deep Throat. And now that we've covered the basics, Let's take a look at these cameras. First up, we have the Cine Kodak Model B from 1925. This is actually the second camera, second home movie camera Kodak ever produced. The first one was the Cine Kodak Model A, or as it was called before the Model B came out, just the Cine Kodak, uh, which was released in 1923. And uh, unlike this one, uh, that one you actually had to hand crank uh, you had to turn a crank exactly two revolutions per second. Any faster and your movie would play back in slow motion. Any slower and dozens of inept police officers would suddenly materialize and chase you across the city. No one knows why, it's just how things worked in the 20s. The Model B improved on that hand crank system by adding a spring drive. You could wind the camera up and push a button and it would uh, it would run for maybe 30 seconds. Now that uh, that spring drive is actually pretty standard for uh, 16 millimeter and eight millimeter home movie cameras for the next 40 years, really until uh, Super 8 came in. Now some of the later higher end models did take batteries or they would accept external motors so you didn't have to wind them up every 30 seconds. But most of them, even 40 years later, like this Cine Kodak, still operated by winding a spring now, the advantage of that system is that there are no wires to corrode, there's no batteries, there's no electronic parts to wear out. It's just clockwork, which is why so many of these still work, including this one, which is 97 years old. For some historical context, that makes this camera three years older than sliced bread. This camera rolled off the assembly line the same year that Chaplin released The Gold Rush, and Blonde Chaney starred in Phantom of the Opera two years before Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic. Only four years after Charlie Chaplin made Jackie Coogan a superstar in The Kid, and more than a decade before Jackie Coogan's mother stole all his money. In Buster Keaton news, this was the year that Keaton released Go West and Seven Chances. Only one of those is deeply uncomfortable to watch in 2022, and shockingly, it's not the one where Buster falls in love with a cow. Next up, we have the Revere Magazine 16 from 1947. Now, most of these cameras take 100-foot rolls of film on what's called a daylight spool. Uh, this film has obviously been exposed. It's useless. That's why it's my test film. But uh, on this spool, so light couldn't get to much of the film, and you could load it in daylight. You didn't have to load it in total darkness uh, like you would a, a professional movie camera. Uh, so most, most cameras took these daylight spools of film. Uh, for instance, this one 
there's the take up spool and you would put your daylight spool of full film I do know what I'm doing sort of behind it this little thing would swing out this is the film counter arm that would uh, depending on where this arm is you see how much film you have left you'd stick your daylight spool in here close this up wind it around through all of this it's this is a real bear to load uh, which is why i don't do it it's also 97 years old and even though it's still working i prefer not to uh not to push it reel it onto your takeout spool close up your camera that's how most of these 16 millimeter cameras worked now the revere magazine 16 and uh, many other magazine models they didn't do that they eliminated the uh the spool for a much more really convenient but sadly obsolete magazine they don't make these magazines anymore which is too bad because it makes loading so much easier you would load these with a little metal magazine containing 50 feet of 16 millimeter film just slide it in close the door lock it and like the Kodak, like all of these cameras, wind it up for up. And then you would take the magazine out, drop it in the mail, send it off to Kodak. They take the film out of the magazine. They keep the magazine to reuse, send you your developed film. And that's obviously more convenient. You don't have to worry about threading your film, which can be a bit of a bear on some of these older cameras. Uh, it's just, it's all in a magazine, works a lot like a cassette tape. Unfortunately, Kodak stopped making those. Uh, the Film Photography Project does sell reclaimed Kodak magazine film. They just took some of the old magazines that are still kicking around out there, put some new film in them, and they will sell them to you. Uh, I'm not getting paid by the Film Photography Project. I'm just a big fan of their work. However, those are sold out a lot of the time. Uh, a lot of people have these magazine cameras, and uh, that's really the only game in town as far as shooting film through them. Now, once again, this camera came off the line in 1947. For some historical context, this camera rolled off the assembly line the same year Jackie Robinson took the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Robert Mitchum started out of the past and Polaroid inventor Edwin Land demonstrated the first instant camera. In Keaton Watch News, 1947 was the year Buster appeared at the Cirque Medrano in Paris, gaining widespread acclaim for his live performances. Next up, we have the Keystone Criterion A9. This is a fancy version of the regular Keystone A9. This is 1949, as I said. Once again, simple wind. This comes with an f2.5 fixed focus lens, but it is a C-mount lens, so you can actually unscrew it, put any other C-mount lens on it. Uh, these lenses actually would be interchangeable because this is, as well, a C-mount lens. Uh, this camera has a few fancy options. We've got uh, a speed counter here, a speed selector rather. Most 16 millimeter home movies shot at 16 frames a second. That was also pretty much the silent movie standard. 24 frames a second came in when sound did. But you can shoot 24 frames a second. You can shoot as low as 10 if you want to speed your action up when it's played back or as high as 64 frames a second if you want some Pretty decent slow motion. Uh, this camera loaded much easier than the Cine Kodak model, which you, you had to, as I showed, open a door and twist the film around. This one is simply reel to reel. Load the film in here, through the sprockets, behind the gate, through the other sprocket, onto your take up reel, and Bob's your uncle. As I said, this camera, which is in amazing condition for, uh, for its age, rolled off the assembly line in 1949. 1949 marked the maiden flight of the de Havilland Comet, the world's first commercial passenger jet airliner. 
It was also the year George Orwell published 1984. Perhaps most importantly, 1949 is the year that Silly Putty goes on sale. Meanwhile, in Keaton Watch News, 1949 was the year Buster Keaton first appeared on television, guest starring on Ed Wynn's live comedy television program. The, the appearance was well received, and television jump started Keaton's stalled career. He was in demand and working steadily for the rest of his life. Finally, we have this Bell and Howell 240 EE. Uh, the EE stands for Electric Eye. Uh, this is one of the early autofocus, or rather auto exposure cameras. It was still a manual focus. It's an auto exposure camera. This big cylinder here, that's a selenium light sensing power, selenium power cell. And uh, this cell would, uh, you'd tell it on this dial, you would tell it what film speed you were using, it would read the light in the room and automatically adjust the lens's aperture to compensate. Uh, and despite the, uh, the high tech of the selenium cell, the camera itself is still, like, uh, like most of these cameras, a wind up. Wind it up, it'll run until the spring winds down. This camera gained a little bit of uh, extra fame because Orson Welles used this particular model to shoot an unfinished movie about uh, Don Quixote. He actually shot some of it on 16mm. Used this camera. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a relatively fancy model. Now, in 1949, the Keystone Criterion A9 went for around $75, which is nothing to sneeze at in 1949. In 1949, money. Uh, that equates to about $900 in 2022 money. This camera in 1957 went for $329.95, which equates in modern dollars to uh, about $3,400. So uh, these didn't come cheap. These were relatively high-end. Uh, they weren't Bolexes, but uh, uh, this is a high-end consumer much further and you probably start getting into the prosumer area. As I said, this camera rolled off the assembly line in 1957. 1957 was the year Russia launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik. On television, Leave it to Beaver premiered. And in Arkansas, federal troops were called in to ensure the Little Rock Nine were able to attend school after Governor Orville Faubus defied segregation law. In Keaton Watch, 1957 was the year a terrible biopic about Buster was released. Starring Donald O'Connor, the Buster Keaton story had almost nothing to do with the actual story of Buster Keaton. However, the money the studio paid Buster for the picture did allow him and his wife to buy a nice house where he raised chickens and tinkered with model railroads for the rest of his days, often while mostly nude. Oh, I didn't see you there. That's it, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, uh, please like and subscribe. And uh, I will see you next time around when I will, I don't know, probably talk about cameras some more. Peace.